And then there's a character named Laser Wolf. A laser wolf? That sounds amazing! Three hours later. Huh. That was a lot less anime-like than I was expecting. Welcome to Faith on Film. I'm Nathan. I'm Stephanie. In 1894, Shalom Aleikum published a series of short stories, Tevye and His Daughters. They were very successful and were adapted to the Broadway musical Fiddler on the Roof, with a few steps in between. The story was by Joseph Stein, with music and lyrics by Jerry Bach and Sheldon Harnick. The show opened in 1964 and was popular enough that seven years later a movie came out. Which makes it an adaptation of an adaptation of an adaptation of an adaptation of a series of books. Well, that sounds like fun. Let's get started, shall we? Well, the director of the movie was a man by the name of Norman Jewison, which, while you may think it sounds like the most appropriate name for this movie, he makes it clear to everyone he is, in fact, a Gentile. Didn't he even have to tell the producers that? Uh, yes, he did. Another thing you'll notice is that the music has been adapted and conducted by John Williams. Yes. That John Williams. Another thing you'll notice is that assisting him on this project was Alexander Courage. Don't know who that is? That's okay. That's the guy who was screwed over by Gene Roddenberry over the Star Trek lyrics. So the Star Wars and Star Trek themes coincide in a weird way here. Funny, huh? So while the musical is known for its big show-stopping opening number, the movie actually starts off a lot more quietly and slowly, letting the atmosphere really set in. Well, it's all part of how film is a different medium from a play. It's more naturalistic, and things that would work on one in one medium don't necessarily translate to the other. Not every movie needs to open with a full orchestral blast. Speaking of that full orchestral blast, let's talk about that big opening number. Now, it's been said that in the best musicals, every song serves a narrative purpose. And if you can take the narrative just from listening to the soundtrack and put it all together, then the songwriter has done their job. Tradition rises to the occasion. It tells us everything that we need to know about the, this world that we're in and the characters who inhabit it. Well, the same could be said of all the songs in this musical. Uh, even L'Chaim, which appears at first to be just a, a big, loud, fun song to celebrate an engagement that is undone a few scenes later, actually does serve a purpose because Russians who are at the bar show that they have a civil, even occasionally friendly relationship with the locals when their government's not getting involved, which builds up the tragedy of the ending. And many of the lyrics carry the, over, the overtone of, yeah, life sucks sometimes, but you gotta take the good with the bad and just keep going. Which is instrumental for Tevye's character arc. A notable example is when he and Laser Wolf sing, life has a way of confusing us, blessing and bruising us, moments before drinking to life. Now let's break down our main character, Rev Tevye. He's, this is a really good character, possibly one of Broadway's best. He's a man of faith, but he's led a hard life. He wants to take care of his family, and his dedication to his faith never wavers. It makes him feel real, even when he reaches his lowest point. His dedication to his tradition has given him purpose. In the centuries since Rome obliterated Herod's temple, the sense of continuity with their ancestors is what has kept their community alive, both with uh, their history and with their present fellow Jews. In this way, Tevi is actually a great example of Jewish life in the diaspora. There's your five dollar word for the day. He's not the only one. Rabbi, Yintel, Golda, these people are who they are and what they have, and it's how they've made it for as long as they have. Well, Tebe as the narrator even makes the point that they don't even know when or how some of their traditions got started, but it doesn't matter because it's just such a fundamental part of their identity. Now, this has garnered some criticism from people of the Jewish community because the historical link to uh, their ancestors is what makes their traditions worthwhile. It'd be kind of like having a movie about a preacher's kid that didn't know what Believer's Baptism was, wouldn't it? A little bit. I mean, since neither of us are Jewish, we can't really relate, but I can see where it's coming from. Yeah. Well, that being said, in a way, this is how tradition works in all faiths. We light the same candles, we sing the same songs, we observe the same holidays day after day and year after year because it really is a part of our identity. In this way, Tevye is actually a great example of a faith-driven character. Uh, compare him to the much more recent movie, God's Not Dead. That movie wasn't about Josh's personal relationship with his faith. That was about browbeating an evil atheist with his superior knowledge. Josh has all the answers from the get-go, and he never changes. Tevia, by contrast, feels real in the world he inhabits. He has questions, he has doubts, he gets angry, he has actual emotions. Once again, he's not the only one. 
When we first meet his daughters, we already see that the oldest daughter, Seidel, is already questioning the matchmaker system. It takes Huddle and Hava a little bit longer to catch on. We learn pretty quickly that this is because Seidel is in love with her childhood friend, Model, but he's a poor tailor. So the likelihood of him being chosen as Seidel's match is basically non-existent. It's not exactly deep insight to say that Fiddler on the Roof presents Tevye's daughters getting into marriages increasingly distant from tradition. Seidel and Model act as their own matchmakers. Hava and Perchik don't even ask for permission just for Tevye's blessing. Plus, he's a Bolshevik. <laughs> and then Hava marries outside their race, but, uh... Put a pin in that because we'll come back to it. Yeah, you don't really see that many sympathetic communist characters in cinema in the 1970s, do you? Yeah. Or today, for that matter. Yeah, in hindsight, it's kind of amazing this movie became a classic. So let's talk about Perchik. So he's that young man with the big ideas. He's going to turn the world upside down. A good comparison would be the students in Les Miserables. And what's really interesting is Tevia takes him in almost immediately. The others in the town uh, are wary of him because he's because of his more radical beliefs. But Tevia likes him and invites him inside, and that introduces Tevia's character right off the bat as a welcoming man. Well, you see this in his interaction with the constable. Now, the constable is a secondary character, but I feel like you gotta at least mention the guy. That's true. You'd be missing something in an analysis if you didn't. At least bring him up. Right. He's friends with Tevia, but is required to, in his words, cause some mischief for the local Jewry because their traditions make them different from everybody else, which makes them very easy to other whenever trouble breaks out. Well, and Tevia is kind to the constable. When he says to him, it's too bad you're not a Jew, he really means it. It's really a sad moment. Well, it just raises the question, is the constable a sympathetic character? The movie and play have gained some criticism from portraying an oppressive character too sympathetically. Personally, I don't think this is valid because it's not like he's portrayed as having a good reason to do that. It, it comes across as he's a friend, but then he makes the wrong decision and is supposed to lose our sympathy at the end. Why is this the second review in a row where anti-Semitism has come up? Anyway, let's talk about Tevye's other half, Golda. Now, this was actor actress Norma Crane's final film role, as she sadly had cancer at the time, a fact that was only known to the director, Norma Jewison, and Topol, who played Tevye. She passed away two years later. Tevye and Golda are quite a pair. Uh, they, they play off each other really well, even though they argue a lot, and sometimes you wonder if they actually love each other. But they both really care for their kids, and they're just an excellent example of a dirt-poor couple who didn't even meet until their wedding day, trying to get to by in an increasingly hostile world. Golda sometimes borderlines on the stereotypical Jewish mother, but she still feels real. She still has her own opinions, her own emotions, and it's when she breaks down at the climax of the film where she really comes to light for me. Though, I have to ask... Would anybody actually fall for that dream sequence? In her defense, there is a precedent in the Hebrew Bible of prophetic messages being conveyed through dreams, both with Nebuchadnezzar and Pharaoh. Eh, fair enough. Then there's the second daughter, Hodel. If Seitel and Model are the lifelong lovers, Hodel and Perchik are more of the people who hate each other when they first meet. She makes a strong first impression with her wit, and we know from Matchmaker that she has a dark sense of humor, which Saito is at least willing to play along with, but it's Hoddle who really shines as the cleverest of the daughters, which makes it not that surprising that she ends up with a scholar like Tevia wanted. It's just too bad that it can't be a little bit closer. The part where Tevia and Hoddle say goodbye, it's pretty damn sad. Hoddle's not exactly riding off into the sunset to join her prince. Perchik has been arrested and has been sent to Siberia, and that's she's joining him out there. You have to wonder, when Tevia says if Perchik was really a good man, he wouldn't be in trouble, if it's more rooted in, I really don't want you to go, than anything else. Because he would know the stories of Joseph and Job very well. Uh, speaking of Job, there's actually an interesting parallel between him and Tevia. The Book of Job is often misunderstood as a solution to the problem of evil when, in fact, it's much more subtle than that. Job never gets an answer. The point of the book is that he remains faithful e e through his troubles, even though he has no answer. And that is his victory. 
Tevia is much the same way. Now, I'm not saying that Fiddler on the Roof is some sort of loose adaptation of the Book of Job, but there are similarities. Both are righteous men who suffer. Both talk to God in a sort of a one-sided conversation. Tevia even accuses God of getting bored and wanting to work mischief on Tevia's life. The constable and Fietka make it clear that Hava is exempt from the expulsion at the end because she left the faith. So they have a way out, but Tevia doesn't take it. In fact, the final scene is him somberly walking away from their home in Havana Tevka, and then he spots the fiddler who has become symbolic of their traditions, and he gestures for the fiddler to come along with them. That is what makes the ending work. Though I have to say, the end credits are really, really jarring. The scene is so somber and sad and quiet, and then suddenly the end credits just come flaring in at a full blast. It's Almost as bad as the transition in The Phantom Menace between Qui-Gon's funeral and the parade. Almost. But think of it, that's not the only thing this movie does better than episode one. But really, people, transitions are key. Well, if transitioning into the closing credits is the biggest criticism we have of this movie, I will gladly take it. Not exactly. You may have noticed that we've avoided talking about Hava's character. Well, there's a reason for that. Her relationship and ultimate marriage with Fiedka is the one that Tevye ultimately can't accept, and he disowns her. That's all well and good for dramatic purposes, but we don't really see any of Hava and Fiedka's relationship, and thus we really don't have any... Well, what makes this boy worth abandoning her family's religion? That's actually a good point, yeah. I mean, we really only see two scenes of them together, when they first meet, and then when she goes to Tevye to get permission to marry him. And there's not really a whole lot in between. What are, what are their common interests? I guess they both really like books? Is that really enough to inspire an apostasy marriage? There are just too many unanswered questions here. Is everybody in Fianca's family this open-minded, or is he running the risk of being expelled from his family as well? Is... How long have these two even been seeing each other at all? What makes this relationship worth the risk of the loss of your family, the loss of your faith? When will Pixar make a movie about a bird falling in love with a fish? There are just too many unanswered questions here. Now, I understand that this is ultimately Tevye's story and how he does ultimately come around, at least as much as he can, when he says, may God be with you, as they go on their way, but I just want to understand Hava as much as I understand her sisters. As the only atheist in a Christian family, I can totally sympathize with that. It's an emotional journey, and there could have been an entire movie just about Hava's side of this story. But we don't really get that. I know, I also sympathize with Hava. I dated and ultimately married a man who was not a Christian. And fortunately for me, things did end up turning out okay, but it wasn't easy. It's... I sympathize with Hava. Or at least I want to. But I know so little about her, just going off the movie, she's about as flighty as a Disney princess. Now that you mention it, Hava is more or less a secondary character up until the point that she tries to introduce Tevya to Fietka. In Tevya's song about her, he refers to her as the favorite child. I, I certainly never got that impression. Just going off of their behavior and dialogue up until that point, I would have guessed Seidel was the favorite. Did Tevye and Hava share a scene? I... not alone, and I don't think they actually share any dialogue. Huh. How about that? I had hoped that when I finally saw Fiddler on the Roof on stage, that it would turn out that there were more scenes of the two of them that it were just cut for time. For example, in the musical, Percheek also has a solo, which was cut for time. But, no, it didn't really happen. In the musical, the two characters have the same two scenes, the first meeting and then the end, when... Te when they come to the home and tell Tevye and the others that they are on their way to Poland. And nothing bad will ever happen to the Jews in Poland. Oh. Anywho, it's not like this makes the film bad. It's still a fantastic piece of cinema. A little like the time travel ending of Superman the movie. You get so close to perfection, and then there's just this one thing at the end that's makes me not give it that rating. It's still pretty close. The characters are wonderful, the costumes, the setting, the world, the music. 
it's really a great movie and one of my favorites. Oh, mine too. Top ten, easily. Quick, what's your favorite song? Oh, ooh, that's a tough one. I'm going to go with La Chaim. It's got a great bombastic energy, it's super fun to dance to, and it's perfect for bachelor parties. Well, you know I have a special place in my heart for Sunrise Sunset. But, really, I think if I have to pick one song, and I do, I gotta go with Sabbath Prayer. Oh, but if you had asked me which was the best song, I would have said that immediately. Cinematography in that is especially beautiful. And notice the foreshadowing of who is across the table from each daughter. There's nobody across the table from Hava. I also love it in the montage sequence when the one little kid yawns because he's bored. It's just, it's so kid. <laughs> but seriously, this, this sequence is beautifully shot, and I just love the feeling of when you cut away from Tevia's home and you see the others in the town lighting their candles and saying their prayers and joining along, and when it culminates in that choir at the end, it's, it, yeah, it's the best song. Another cinematography highlight is when everyone is saying goodbye to Anna Tevka. The scene where the rabbi is saying goodbye to his synagogue for the final time, which was also added for the movie. When they're all packing up and moving, just the mud, the colors, the cinematography, it is it is beautiful. There's also a subtle element running throughout the film. When we open, it's in springtime, and then by the end of Act 1, it's summer. And then after the intermission, it's fall, and then at the end of the movie, it's winter. Now, we know that the movie doesn't literally take place over the course of a single year because, well, Seitel and Model have a baby during or roughly sometime after the intermission. But it's a, it's a neat way of conveying the, the inevitable changing of the times. And you know, the movie ends with Tevia and his family going to America in the 1920s. He'll experience a lot of changes then. You know, he still has two daughters. And if we're going to continue them going further and further away from tradition, I'll bet you the next one's going to be a flapper girl. And it'll be prohibition, so Tevia won't even be able to get a drink. Aww. So in conclusion, Feather on the Roof is a great movie. It's a good story with good characters. It really is a must-see, not only for musical theater fans, but for film fans in general. Also a fantastic translation from stage to screen, knowing what to drop, what to add and how to keep the tone consistent. And in our book, it gets a hearty money's worth. Well, that all wraps it up for Faith on Film's review of Fiddler on the Roof. I'm Stephanie. I'm Nathan. We'll see you next time. I feel like her in the Star Trek IV. Communications is ready. Communications officer is ready. She'll ever be. <laughs> when we first meet his daughters, Seidel, we see that the oldest, sorry, will survive. I wonder who it will be. This is the ultimate showdown. Ultimate destiny. Yeah, you know, soon I we were recording with that, that would make a great movie. I started halfway through. Alright. <laughs> Coffee burp. <laughs> it's best we got that out before the camera started rolling. That's the dream. <laughs> Fuck.